This is lesson 1.2 in Integrated Math 3, and this deals with sampling and different types of sampling. So there are several types of samples. What is sampling? First of all, sampling is uh, ways that you would take survey or gather data for uh, statistical analysis. <clears throat> so among the types are a random sample, systematic sample, a cluster sample, a stratified, convenience, and volunteer. And we'll look at each one of these and what they are and what their uh, advantages and disadvantages are. So a population is every member of a group. So the population of students at Hoover High School would include every single student at Hoover High School. This year, the U.S. government is taking the census. The government uh, hopes to count the entire population of the United States. A sample is a selected subset or part of that group. So at Hoover High School, um, uh, well, the previous slide showed uh, the names of different types of samples, and we're going to study these. But at Hoover High School, a sample might be one class or just a, some sort of selected group. So we're going to study different types of samples and how they can be chosen. <clears throat> a parameter is what we want to learn about the sample population. For example, what brand of shoes people buy would be a parameter. Uh, their age could be a parameter. Um, just anything that relates to the sample uh, that you want to study in particular. So here's an example we talked about in class. A grocery store wants to know the average number of items that shoppers purchase in each visit. <clears throat> they decide to count the items in the cart of every tenth person through the checkout line. What would be the population? Well, the population would be all of the customers of the grocery store. What would be the sample? The sample would be every tenth person. So if they want to know about all of the customers of the grocery store, why don't they ask everybody? Because it would just take too much time. It would be too hard to do that. So what they take is a small subset and they assume that whatever is true of that small subset in terms of how many items they buy with their average items, that will be true of the entire population. And if you do the sampling properly, it is true. It's, it, it'll be very accurate. And what would be the parameter? What's well, what they're trying to find out? And in this case, it's the average number of items that shoppers purchase with each visit. Okay, so what proportion of Skittles are red? So what would be the population there? <clears throat> it would be all Skittles, all the Skittles that are manufactured. That would be the population. What would the sample be? Well, there's a number of ways you could do it, but one way you could do it is maybe buy a bag or maybe five bags or 10 bags, not a whole lot, but, but enough to give you a pretty good representation of Skittles. And then the parameter would be um, red. How many of them are red? You want to know color. How many are red? A random sample is a sample taken from the populations without any conditions regarding who will be chosen. It's random. So you're in charge of school ASB activities and you want to know what students would like to participate in during the school year. So you're going to take a survey. So the one way you could do that is you can place the name of every single student in the school in a box and randomly draw names. Uh, you would then contact these students with a survey. So that would be a completely random sample. Systematic random sample is a sample taken from the populations uh, by choosing students in an ordered way. So you're in charge of school ASB activities and you want to know what students would like to participate in this year's activities. But this time you take a list of students in the school and assign them a number. <clears throat> and then you decide to choose every 10th student on the list. Why would you do it that way? Well, maybe you know that um, a list of all the students in the school has been given to a number of other organizations and that they're going to take surveys and you might figure that, well, some of the other surveys might just take the first uh, 50 names on the list. So everybody whose name begins at A, with, with the last name begins with A, they might decide to just start at the top of the list 
in alphabetical order and just work their way down. You want to be sure you don't do that. You know, it's, you, that's not going to be, a, you're going to oversample those people if that's what happens. So you want to be sure you, you get a random sample, just a smattering of people throughout the list, kind of done randomly. So you might choose to do every 10th student. Cluster random sample is taken from the populations by choosing certain groups in the population, then surveying individuals in each group. So you're in charge of school ASB activities and you want to know what activities the students want to do, or participate in. So you randomly select four first period classes, those would be considered clusters in the school, and then you survey all of the students. So for example, you pick a class that's mostly ninth graders, another one mostly 10th, one, another one mostly 11th, another one mostly 12th. That may be one way to do that. Okay, a stratified random sample is a sample taken from the populations by choosing certain groups in the population, then surveying individuals in the group. So it's kind of taking the, the um, random, the uh, cluster sample one step further. So you're in charge of ASB again. So you randomly select four first period classes, clusters as you did in the last one. And then you realize you don't need to ask everyone in those classes. Uh, you might ask two people from each class to take the survey. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, you're trying to making two cuts. You're first making a cut of which classes you're going to look at, and then you're making a cut of which students in those classes you're going to look at. So that's a stratified, stratified just means layered uh, random sample. A convenient sample is taken from the population by choosing certain groups in the population and then surveying individuals in each group. So you're in charge of the ASB again and you stand at the door of the cafeteria at lunch and ask students if they would like to participate in your survey. And a volunteer random sample is a volunteer sample is a sample taken from the population by choosing certain groups and surveying individuals in each group. So in this case, you place copies of the sample on a table in the cafeteria. Now, one problem with the, um, <clears throat> one problem with the convenience sample is, let's say you're at a school that doesn't have a free lunch program, then uh, you're sampling people that go into the cafeteria to buy their lunch. Uh, you may be getting students that have more money that um, that are more affluent because they have to pay for their lunch. So you might be getting a biased sample. You don't mean it to be biased in that way, <clears throat> but um, you are getting uh, students with a particular characteristic and not getting students that bring their own lunch because they don't have the money to buy their own lunch. So that's one problem with doing it that way at a specific location. There may be certain groups of students that go to that location, whereas other groups of students don't go to that location. And the issue with the volunteer sample is just by laying out, um, just by laying out, placing copies of a sample on a table, that's not a particularly way good way to do the sample. People may not take it seriously. They might make mistakes. They might not understand how to do it properly. That's really probably the poorest way to do, to, to do a sample. A statistical study includes all methods of collecting data, and these can include surveys. So what we just looked at, that's just one way of collecting data. Some others would be observations, collecting data by just watching. This could be used when communication with people is not necessary. So collecting information on what types of cars there are in City Heights could be done by just standing out in front of Hoover and watching cars go by on El Cajon Boulevard. You don't need to talk to anyone, you just need to observe. And then experiments, and this is collecting data in controlled settings. Controlled experiments are more difficult uh, with the issue of human behavior where many other factors can have effect on results. Really experiments are better in things like physical sciences where you want to you know, be able to control, uh, you're doing an experiment, you want to be able to control the temperature and the quantities of the materials that you're using and things like that. Um, so with things, it's, it's, it's good to have controlled experiments in science. With social sciences where you're dealing with people, sometimes it's difficult. A lot of things can enter into it that um, you're not expecting. 
So imagine you want to know whether a new diet plan is effective in helping people lose weight. You might choose any of the three methods to determine this. <clears throat> you can use a survey and ask people that have tried the diet plan if they lost weight. Um, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of this? Well, they may not be totally telling the truth. They may just not accurately remember uh, what they did. They may have sort of done the diet plan, but sort of not done the diet plan. So there are always issues with relying on just people uh, recounting something and, and determining something like that. Um, you can use obser uh, an observational study and monitor volunteers that tried the plan to measure weight loss. Of course, that's difficult. You can't follow people around uh, to do that. So that, that's kind of challenging to do that. But you could, what you could really do, what more li likely way is have them come in for a weigh-in every week or every month, something like that, and see how they're doing. So you'd have to have some parameter that you're measuring, like obviously their weight. That would be one that would be typical. And three, you can assign participants to two, to two groups. The first group is called a control group in which they don't use the diet plan. The second is called the experimental group, which uses the diet plan, and then you compare the two groups. So that's called a control and an experimental group. You have to try to be sure that the two groups are pretty much the same in every other way, um, that they do the same amount of exercising, that they uh, do other things pretty much the same uh, in every way, the only difference being that one of them is doing the diet plan and the other one is not. All right, so a person uh, wants to lose weight. Uh, he wants to study what uh, best results in weight loss. So he decides, decides to do three things. He controls his diet, he takes nutritional supplements, and he starts an exercise program. What problem can you find in this experimental design? So what would be the problem? So all those three things he does, he records, the, he records everything carefully, what he's eaten, what nutritional supplements he's taken, what exercise he's done, um, and he wants to see what results in weight loss. What's the problem with that experimental design? Think about that. Well, the problem is that he did not isolate the variable. Uh, he can't be sure which of the three changes resulted in the weight loss. It may have been totally because of diet and had nothing to do with the nutritional supplements or the exercise program. So when you want to do an experiment, and when I've helped students do projects, a lot of times they want to study too many things at the same time. You've got to isolate one thing uh, and choose to study that and uh, keep everything else the same, which we say keep it constant. Okay, you want to know what proportion of the population likes jazz music. You consider three ways to study, uh, to conduct a study. What are the similarities and differences between the three alternatives? So one, you take, a, you can take, this is one way you can do it, you can take a sample of people and survey and do they like jazz? You could visit a music store and observe purchases that people make. Or you can monitor emotional response of people through sensing devices in a lab environment to see how they respond to jazz. Does, uh, do they get emotionally excited? Does their pulse go up? Uh, things like that, kind of like what a lie detector does, but you just sense their emotional responses. Okay, so that's it. It was a pretty simple lesson. Not a lot of math in it, was there? Um, but it just has to do with how you might take surveys. This might come in handy someday uh, if you are involved in a survey on campus. We're not going to do one in this class, obviously, now. Maybe we would do a small one if we were back in school. But anyway, you'll, you have some ideas of the different ways that you can do that. And um, so we'll move on to our next lesson in statistics on... Um, I will post the video before Wednesday and uh, you, will, you can go on and work on that if you would like. Okay, have a good day.